Welcome back to another episode in our Electric and Magnetic Fields series. Um, a couple items of business before we get into today's code. Uh, the first thing you might notice when you look at the screen is that I've got this little uh, warning. It's not an error, just letting me know that there is a new version of GlowScript available. So I am recording these videos about a month ahead of when they'll be released. So this is probably old news to you by now, but if you've been working in GlowScript and you see this, you can update your 2.6 to 2.7. Um, I'm going to be looking over the changes to GlowScript 2.7, and I'll probably make a couple of videos just exploring uh, those new options available, um, just to save you the time of having to go through the documentation. Um, the other change that I'm thinking about doing, I've been releasing these videos once a week, and then having another set of videos release on uh, on the other day of the week, Wednesday. So these go up on Mondays, the others go up on Wednesdays. I think starting with this week, I'm gonna re uh, release the the ENM field videos uh, every Monday and Wednesday. Um, actually, no, that would be the following week. That would be next week, because um, I'm waiting for the series on Wednesday about the fantasy name generator to finish up. And then I think I'm gonna uh, work my way through these codes two days a week. Um, just to see if that has any impact on, uh, you know, how well we, how well I can retain viewers in terms of the, the, the series. Um, if two videos a week in the same series is too much for you, uh, just let me know and I will go back to the way it was. Um, of course, if you're watching this in the distant future, you don't notice in any way, you're just binge watching the entire playlist, I'm sure. So with that business taken care of, let's get on to the physics. Um, we have developed a, a, a framework in which we can calculate the net electric field of a set of point charges. Let's skip down to the end where we can review the way we're doing that. Basically what we're doing is uh, we're able to loop over a set of observation points. So this is where the field is being measured. Um, Griffiths would call this the, uh, the field point. And we're taking from that to get the relative position vector the uh, source point, uh, the place where the charge is located, the place where the field is emanating from. So Griffiths calls that the source point. So your relative position vector R is just observation point minus source point. So we have two loops here. We've got a loop over the observation points and we've got a loop over the source points because each observation point gets a, a, a net field that's the sum of all the fields from the source points. So if you think of this as an integral, this is where we're actually conducting the integral is in the interior loop. And then this is just where we're setting the observation point for the value of the integral. And so all of our information about the source charges is contained in a list. In this code, it's called slices. I think in the last one, it was called sources. Doesn't really matter what you call it, um, as long as you have a list of these objects. And these objects need a position, obviously. Uh, they need a charge value, we're going to call that Q here, and they need to have uh, the visual element of the sphere object. So we're setting up our, um, our source charges up here in the slices array, uh, or slices list, excuse me. And basically, when we want to look at a different set of, a, base, a, a different charge configuration, we just change this part of the code. The observation point we can change as well, but this part, the, uh, the, the loop over the observation point and the source charges, we don't really need to change that. The only thing we need to change is the charge distribution and the points we're looking at. So what we've set up here is a line of charge or a charged rod as uh, matter and interactions refers to it. What we do is we tell the code how many uh, points we want to have in the charge, so how many slices we're dividing the, the, the charge rod into. We give the rod a length and we give it a total charge. And so we set up this loop here to go over the number of slices and basically we add to this list a new slice each time. So we're making the slices look like spheres. You could make them into uh, boxes or cones or whatever you wanted to make them into. The shape doesn't actually impact the calculation where it's just a visualization for the point charge. So we have to give us here a position. You notice that they're all along the, let's see, they're all going to be along the y axis because we've got x equals zero and z equals zero and we're moving up from the base value of y, from the bottom value of y, uh, up and increment dy each time. So each time we're adding dy to the y-coordinate. Um, dy is being set 
up here as just the length divided by n. So this is a piece you don't have to change. So this is automatically set up as the length of the rod divided by the number of slices. We have to give the spheres a radius. Uh, I'm just making that dy over two so that they don't overlap each other. Uh, we're gonna make them the color red because they're positively charged. And then we're adding on this cube. This is not normally part of the sphere function, but this uh, sphere function is robust enough to take additional uh, parameters or additional attributes. So you can say comma Q equals this and it just attaches a Q onto it. And so this is just the total charge divided by the number of slices, just exactly what you would expect. So that if you add up all the charges, uh, you get the total charge as you should. Our observation points, uh, we start out with an empty list of observations. Uh, we're going to be going around in a circle again. We've got our y obs at zero, so that should be the center of the charged rod. So basically this is the height. This is the thing we can change. And then we, we have the same type of code that we had previously where we're going around in a circle. So anytime you have our cosine theta and our sine theta, you're going to get some sort of circle in some plane. Uh, in this case, it's going to be in the xz plane. Uh, because we're keeping the Y fixed, or at least it'll be parallel to the XZ plane, I should say. If we change this from zero, it won't technically be the XZ plane, but it's it's parallel to the plane. So, um, And then we just add that point to the observations here. So we're going to get a set of, of observation points going in a circle around the charged rod. And uh, we can add more observation points down here. We'll do that in just a minute. Um, I'm going to hit Control-2 to run this to see what it looks like. And so we get something we probably expect to see. Um, the, the field is going away from the positive charges. Um, you notice that the field is the same as you go around the charge rod because this thing has uh, radial symmetry. Um, I think that's the right term. Yeah, yeah. This thing has, this thing has a, a radial symmetry, a cylindrical symmetry is probably the best way to say that. So that as you go around this thing along the shell of a cylinder, uh, the field doesn't change. It's, it's, it's a nice way to... Um, to apply Gauss's law actually to get the, the field for an infinitely long uh, line of charge. And so uh, another thing you notice is that the field's coming out perpendicular to the charged rod. That's because we have an equal amount of charge spaced out equally above the observation circle as we do below. So all of the field uh, components that are coming down this way are canceling with the field components coming down this way so that only the outward components um, are adding together. We can observe something different if we change the observation point. So let's say we move this thing up. Let's see, how long is our charged rod? It is a length of one, so it's going up. So it's going from zero here up to 0.5 up here. So if we wanted to put it, say, in the middle, uh, we'd have to go to y equals 0 0.25. Let's make this a 0.25. Uh, run with control two. And now you notice that cancellation doesn't happen. So now we have a net uh, electric field component pointing up this way. So we still get radially outward, as we would expect. Um, but now we have more charge distributed down this way that's not being canceled by charge up here. So if I zoom out, there's charge missing up here that's not canceling the charges down here, well, not canceling the charges, but canceling the field uh, from the charges down here. Uh, so we get a little bit net upward uh, uh, direction to the field. But you still notice that it's radially symmetric, right? So we haven't destroyed the, 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 the radial symmetry there. Let's move it up even farther. Uh, let's go past the point of the top. So let's go up to 0 0.75. So now all of the charge is below the the, uh, the circle of observation point, so we get even more of a component going upward. But you notice that our total uh, vector length has decreased. That's because we're getting farther away. Like we saw last time, electric field uh, gets smaller the farther away you get from the, uh, from the source of the field, from the charges. Okay, let's do something uh, a little bit more fun. Uh, uh, let's finish out with adding some additional observation points. So let's suppose I take this thing and copy it and then paste, and paste a few more times. What I can do is I can repeat this process. Um, I've only set the empty list once, so each time here I'm just adding to the observations list. So I can just change where the, uh, where the circle is located in terms, of a, in terms of altitude. So I can make this uh, 0 0.25 like we had before. 
I can make this 0 0.5. Let's go to 0 0.75. And then, that's only going up. Let's also go down the rod. Let's do a copy and a paste. I can go down the rod just by making these folks negative. So it helps to think ahead with what you want to do with the code because then usually you can copy and paste and change things instead of having to type them over and over again. And here is what we get. It looks to me like one of those uh, massage rollers that you get at Bed Bath & Beyond and like the, in the as seen on TV bin at the front of the store. Um, so here you can see uh, we, we've got the, the flat um, vectors here. We've got vectors cur curving down this way. We've got vectors curving up this way. Um, but you notice that it's symmetric from the top to the bottom. So these vectors are pointing uh, kind of at the, as the mirror image of the vectors down here, including all the way uh, down to the bottom and down to the top. So here's your electric field of a line of charge. It's nice to be able to visualize this. Um, another thing you can do is you can set the, the R value bigger so that you, you make the observation points farther out, but I'll leave that for you to do. I'm sure uh, you are more than capable of doing that after seeing this example. Um, next time we're going to take this and we're going to extend this out into two dimensions so that we have a sheet of charge. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you, uh, this is going to be worth watching because that took me about a week to figure out how to do because it, it encounters some calculational problems that I did not anticipate. So thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.